pray for our speaker, Lord, that they will resonate you and they will radiate you. Um, that the things that the students remember um, isn't of us, but it's of you. Um, and ultimately, just they get to experience you in a new and special way. So, Lord, I just thank you for your hand over today and for the rest of our lives. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you. So, um, counter will start in about two minutes. Great. And we'll hit the ground running. Roll from there. Sweet. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, is this? You can sit down front if you want to. Great. Okay. Yes. I'm just going to make sure. To hang back here with us, or you can go sit out there. Great. Great. Thank you. And then they did something with women a few years ago. But I knew nothing about it. No one told me. So if you knew anything about women, like women history, yeah, I'd love to know. I actually need to touch base with you on that to know what women's ministry is doing, okay. if anything, for Women's History Month. Well, we have. Okay. Yeah. So we do have a Women's History Month like schedule of events in the works. Um, we don't have like a speaker focused on faith at all yet. So if we want to partner and get an event on the calendar for like women in faith or like challenges faced by women today in the church. Yeah. That'd be awesome. Yeah. That would be great. Yeah, we have, I don't know what your, your Wednesdays at 1010 are probably chapel. Well, I, I don't do it on Wednesdays, I do Fridays, but right. I come sometimes, but I don't have to be here, does that make sense? There's a committee so meeting for the Women's History Month subcommittee um, on Wednesday, so I'll just email you that info, and hopefully we can touch base at that and get that. Brilliant. I don't have to be a part, I don't have to help. No, but I want there to be something with women's ministry and with campus events. Great. All the stuff on there, so That'd be awesome. Yeah. So our, our, our media team will do that. Excellent. All right, girlfriend. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, I'm going to just carry a lot of this out and go. Okay. Yeah, and then just come right this way. Brilliant. Thanks, Becky. Thank you. All right. Okay. Yeah, come around to us now. Hello. Hello. Can I steal the seat next to you? Hey, how are y'all doing? You brought your kazoos? <laughs> Haven's like, we did not. Kazoos are better than the sparklers, so as long as it's not fire. <laughs> as long as it's not fire, we're okay. Okay. Yeah, is this how it's supposed to be? Is this going to stay? Yeah. Great. Okay. So, yeah, we're set. So, I'm just able to sit out here until it starts. Great. And I think I turned this on. It is. It's green. Great. You should be fine. I've already dropped it once. <laughs> nice. They'll keep you <laughs> muted until the relevant time. Which is excellent news. Mm -hmm. How are you feeling? a little shaken, so we're good. Can I pray for you? Yes, please. Okay. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day, for the chance we to speak, to invest in our student body, and to instill wisdom in them through your Holy Spirit. Would you use her in this time, but would eyes not be on her, but on you, Lord, that she would reflect your glory, and that she would seek you above all things. Would you continue to pray for a spirit of humility and love as she goes about this, and that you call many nerves that she rests secure in what she's going to say, that she knows it's biblical, that it's centered on you, and that is what this student body needs to do. We love you, Lord, and we seek you. In your name, let her pray. Amen. Thanks, babe. Mm -hmm. Love you. I love you, too. You're going to kill it. Thanks. It'll be great. I'm proud of you. Hmm. Okay. Got this. Got my tea. I have the bookmark in the right spot. It is on do not just
Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Thank you. That's so good. Welcome to worship. Are y'all tired? I feel like a bear. Like I just want to, I just want to stink and hibernate. You know, it's going to be like 31 tomorrow. Like, what is that? Okay, so if it's 31 and snowing, I'm very happy. But if it's like the sun's out, like, I don't, I don't know. Okay, well, but anyway. Well, listen, we're excited to have you at worship today. And um, I'm happy to welcome you. Um, I'm excited to um, have the profess a professor on our campus that's speaking. Um, her name is, I have to get my little, excuse me, I have to get my notes out because I'm old. And old people just don't remember things. Okay, Lynette Miller Rinberg. Rinberg. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm gonna ooh, I'm so excited. Okay. All right. Lynette Miller Rinberg, assistant professor of history. She has like a fan, like this is her fan club down here. So and um, she has studied, uh, has a doctor of philosophy of history from Baylor University. She has also has a master of letters from in modern history from the University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Hello. So we're really, really excited to hear you today. We're praying for you, and we're so excited that everyone's here at worship today to just focus on the Lord. So as we come in, let's get our hearts and our minds focused, and let me just open us in a, in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that you are imprinted in our hearts today, Father, that your son Jesus came so that we can sit here, Father, and be free. So I pray, God, as we come to this place to worship, that our hearts and our minds would be incredibly, incredibly um, in tune with, our, with your Holy Spirit that lives within us and gives us power. And we ask your word, Father, to spread across this room, to intertwine our hearts, and for us to grow closer to you. We pray for our speaker, Father, and fill her with your Holy Spirit. Bring the words that we need to hear today through her. In Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.
continue worshiping this morning as we sing this out. Let's praise the name above all names. In the darkness we were waiting without hope and without light. So from heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets, to a virgin came the word. From the throne of endless glory to a cradle in the just praise you in this moment right now. Thank you for this opportunity to come and worship you freely. We love you so much and we're so thankful. Prepare our hearts to hear your word this morning. Amen. All right, so good morning, everybody. Um, Excellent. Good start. Um, I'm excited to be here with you this morning and to get a chance to speak with you for a little bit. So, as you heard from Becky Walker's introduction, and as a lot of you probably already knew, I am a history professor. Now, 
that doesn't mean that all historians are going to agree with what I'm about to say, but for me, part of why I went into history is because I hated math and science. Like, absolutely hated them. Every class I had to take, high school, college, could not be convinced. Now, my parents, however, are chemical engineers. So they had a really different opinion about how much I should like math and science than I did growing up. I remember one particular instance when I was in high school complaining about chemistry. I think I had been like crying into my chemistry textbook while I was studying. And my dad tried to convince me that I should love chemistry. Now, he took a kind of unusual tactic with this. He tried to convince me to, that I should love chemistry because of moles. Um, not the animal, that probably would have been a more successful approach to take, but because of the unit of measurement, this really precise, long number that I was having to memorize that measured things and told you how these chemical elements would react. To my dad, this was beautiful. This was the reason I should love chemistry. I was not persuaded. Um, and that's maybe not surprising, because as those of you who actually take chemistry would probably say, measuring things is not the most exciting part about the subject. It's not the thing that people find convincing or that they find exciting. But for my dad, that was something he loved, and that was something convincing. Now, generally, when we talk about things we love, when we talk about things that we're passionate about, we tend to go to the heart of the matter. We don't tend to talk about the minor tangents that go with the subject, but we tend to talk about the thing that makes it so great. If you're a sports fan, you probably don't talk about like the color of the grass on the field your team plays on, or the shoes that your kicker wears. Let's be honest, no one tries to convince you to like a football team based on the kicker at all. But you talk about the school's winning record. You talk about like the feeling you have when you go to a game, when you get to be a part of this tradition. You talk about the great fight song, right? You go to the things that make this thing that you love something unique. Same thing if you talk about coffee. Um, this is a passion I know that I share with a lot of you. If you're trying to convince someone who's skeptical about coffee to love coffee, you don't talk about like the color of the tiles in the coffee shop. You talk about how delicious coffee is, the way it makes you feel, all the different ways you can prepare it. Pretty much everybody has something that they love that they can talk about at great length. And usually, if you're coming up against someone who's skeptical about that thing, you start with the heart of the matter. You go straight to the point and the reasons why people should love this. What I kind of want to explore today is if we're as good at getting at the heart of what we love when we talk about the gospel. Are we as good at getting to the heart of the message of the gospel as we are to the heart of the message about our favorite TV series or coffee or football? So to explore that question today, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians 1. So Corinthians is one of Paul's letters to the churches that he planted and discipled. And in the letter to the Corinthians, Paul is addressing a church in a bustling city, one that's incredibly diverse in its membership and, as we're about to find out, struggling with unity. They're struggling with how to be a united witness, how to live as a community together in a city that has many different cultures, languages, religions, and priorities. The Corinthians had a solid foundation from Paul's ministry there, but were they bearing witness to that foundation? To what were they bearing witness in Paul's absence? So starting out, verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be his holy people, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus. For in him you have been enriched in every way, with all kinds of speech and with all knowledge, God thus confirming our testimony about Christ among you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will also keep you firm to the end, so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
God is faithful, who has called you into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So there we see the foundation. There we see what has brought together this body of believers in a city where they had very little other reason to come together. We see that they've been unified, they've been given a common purpose, a common calling, and grace. They've been given these gifts through the Spirit, through the Gospel. Doesn't continue on quite as positive a note, so let's carry on here. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So what we see happening here, what's going on? As the book of 1 Corinthians opens, we are introduced to a church that I think looks a lot like our own. A church that has gotten confused as to what exactly they're supposed to be testifying about and who they're supposed to be following. We hear not that the Corinthians are testifying to the message that Paul taught them, to the grace they received in Christ Jesus, or to God's faithfulness in calling and keeping them in fellowship with his Son, but instead to individual leaders. Some claim Paul, some Apollos, some Cephas, and a few got it right and did claim Christ, so good job them. But this isn't a church united in its witness. This isn't a church united in the good news that it's sharing, that it's talking about with the city in which it lives. Every time I read this passage in 1 Corinthians, I can't help but think of the figures mentioned, like Apollo, Cephas, has like these sort of like early church influencers, right? Like they've each shot their Instagram, their podcast, they're like hyping up the products they're selling, wanting you to listen to their lives, like focus in on their TikToks. They've gotten caught up in being the center and being the thing that matters rather than the message they're talking about. Certainly the Corinthians have lost sight of what they're supposed to be focusing on. They're focusing on these leaders, these human leaders, instead of the person of Christ. From this first half of Corinthians, it's clear that the church in Corinth has lost the thread. They've forgotten what it is they're supposed to be testifying to what it is that they're supposed to be preaching. And lest we think that this is just a problem in Corinth and that we don't do the same thing, how many of you have actively tried to convince your friends to go to BCM instead of RUF, or RUF instead of BCM? How many of you, like, slam the book they're reading because it's not by the right Christian author, it's not by your favorite? How many of you identify as fans of your pastor back home, or Dr. Chuck Fuller, Dr. Chris Barnett, Becky Walker, right? We still do this. We still set up these kind of fan cultures around the human conveyors of the message, rather than the message itself. We're really good at following people rather than God. And I think the result of this, as we see pretty clearly in this Corinthians passage, and today, is division. Quarrels, and ultimately, false teachings that put humanity in the place of God. That tangent on baptism, it feels a little weird, it feels like Paul's kind of just taken a hard turn and is just kind of ranting about small matters, but I think what he's pushing against here is this false teaching of centering the work of humans rather than the work of God. In talking about who baptized who, they're centering the person administering the sacrament rather than the grace that God conveys through baptism, the miraculous fact that God uses baptism as a part of our salvation process. I think we do this a lot today, too. 
maybe some of us with baptism, but a lot of us with centering kind of the humans doing the work of God rather than the work of God itself. A church that misses the heart of the gospel is a church that's divided and quarrelsome, one that looks more like the world than the body of Christ. The Corinthians are focusing on the fringes rather than on the key to the message. They're focusing on minor plot points rather than the big picture. And it's tearing the church apart. So, what is this message that they forgot? We'll turn back to 1 Corinthians because Paul spells it out very clearly for us. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. That is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The message the Corinthians forgot was simple. It's the message of Christ crucified, the incarnate God who willingly died for our sins to save those who believe. This is the heart of the gospel. This is what we are called to bear witness to. Not to human teachers, not to signs and wisdom, but to the person of Christ in his incarnation, death, and resurrection. God became human in the form of a tiny baby. This incarnate God then lived a fully human and yet sinless life, ultimately dying a horrible death on the cross to save us from our sins and to bring us back into fellowship with God through his death and resurrection. This, this is the message that we are supposed to be bearing witness to. As Paul makes clear, this is both a radically simple and a radically confusing message. It's no wonder the Corinthians and all of us try to make it more complicated. We try to make it seem wise to the world. We try to make it make sense using our human logic. But as Paul points out, this message is radically simple for a reason. It's to confound those who think they are wise, to highlight the power of God and the wisdom of God, to put God at the center rather than us as the conveyors of the message. So a note of caution here, because I think sometimes we can assume that it's because of the fact that this message is so radically simple. It's because of the fact that this message does not make sense to the world. I think we can assume sometimes that if we encounter any resistance in our daily lives, it's because of the message. And that may very well be true. But I think a question we have to ask ourselves is, are we actually preaching this message to then encounter resistance, or are we just thinking about it? Are we just living in ways that we think reflects the gospel, but everyone around us is completely confused by? To give an example of what I mean by this, I'm going to talk about a woman named Marjorie Kemp. Um, you knew you were not getting out of here with at least one medieval example sneaking in. So... <laughs> 
Marjorie Kemp is a medieval woman who lives in the 1400s. From the accounts we have of her life, it's really clear she does have a deep faith. She is deeply devoted to Christ, and she is incredibly passionate about the message of the gospel, about Christ's life, death, and resurrection. It's also very clear from the accounts of her life that she is not well-liked by most people. Now, she gets abandoned on pilgrimage, so she's just kind of left by herself by the side of the road. She gets kicked out of a lot of different churches, even banned from going into some. She gets run from town to town, and she narrowly escapes getting burnt at the stake a couple of times. Marjorie's take on all of this is that this resistance is because she loves God so much. People around her don't understand, they don't love God as much as she does, and they just don't understand, like, what this radical faith looks like. And that may sometimes be true, but when I read through accounts of Marjorie's life, I also think there's something else going on. Every time she gets kicked out of church, it's not because she's talking too much about Jesus. It's because she's doing something that her biographer describes as roaring. This is crying so loudly that she falls down on the ground, drowns out the priest who's trying to give a sermon, and doesn't stop for like 30 to 40 minutes. When she gets abandoned on pilgrimage, it's because she's so overcome thinking about Christ, no, just thinking about Christ, she's not actually talking about him, that every time she sees a man, woman, child, or animal, she falls off of her donkey crying and just lays there again for like an hour. Is it really fair to say the resistance Marjorie is encountering is because of the gospel when she's not actually saying the gospel? She's just lying there crying. Does that count as resistance to the gospel if no one around her understands what the gospel is? I think we need to do both a heart check and an action check. Are we encountering resistance because we're preaching the gospel? Are, are we encountering resistance because we're disrupting everything with our crying, right? Like, it's a good question to ask. So I find this super convicting. And I think for all of us living in a culture that's every bit as contentious as Corinth, I think we should be asking ourselves this question often. Are we preaching the gospel? And is that why we feel like we're not fitting in? Is that why we feel like we're getting resistance from employers or family or friends or culture? Or... Are we forgetting to actually preach the gospel and getting hung up on minor things along the way? To preach the gospel as we are called to, we need to not only actually verbalize the message, we also need to be willing to set aside influence. We need to be willing to decenter ourselves. We need to refocus any glory or honor from the message onto Christ alone and fade into the background. To paraphrase John 3.30, Christ must increase as we must decrease. By doing so, by focusing on the gospel, by focusing on Christ, by coming together at the foot of the cross, we can be united. We can bear a united witness to the world around us and experience this fellowship with God and each other that we were given through salvation. So practically then, What does this look like for us today? No one's on the floor crying, so everyone's doing a good job with that. Um, It's a good start. But what do we do as we leave? How do we avoid being the Corinthians, fighting over influence and minor points, rather than bearing witness to Christ? What does it look like to bear witness to the radically simple gospel in a world that's full of lots of voices and opinions? So first, I think we need to set aside our quest to be known. I think we need to set aside the desire to have influence, to be remembered, to be important. And we need to pursue unity in the church and the glory of God. I think first, we need to start by doing this with ourselves. We need to be careful that we don't make Christ's message and the life of Christ about ourselves. We need to be willing to sound foolish to be countercultural, and to be forgotten. But second, I think we need to be wary of those who center their work, their theology, their understanding of the gospel, their fame, their publications, their TikTok. I don't know if people do theology on TikTok. I'm not actually on there, but um, we need to be wary of those who center themselves instead of Christ, right? 
If someone is putting themselves at the heart of the gospel, then it's not the gospel they're preaching. Second, I think we need to be careful not to confuse our wisdom with that of God's. Specifically, I think we need to be sure we don't make the gospel more complicated than it actually is. We so often try to make the gospel Jesus and. Jesus and this political party. Jesus and this denomination. Jesus and this cultural battlefield. Jesus and this social priority. Some of these issues, we may indeed have stances on them that grow out of our faith in Christ. As Christians, we should indeed fight for and advocate for life, for truth, for justice. But at the same time, that is not the gospel. That's living out the gospel once you are a Christian. We need to focus and bearing witness on the heart of the matter. And as we think about unity in the body of Christ, we need to focus on Christ, not on the periphery. Not on the right position on social justice or abortion or gender issues. We need to be focused on Christ himself. And that leads to the third and most important point. We really have to keep the gospel all about Christ. That is the gospel. We're called to go into the world and preach the gospel. But it's this gospel that the New Testament makes very clear is Christ incarnate, crucified, and resurrected. It's only if someone hears and accepts that good news that the wisdom of God will make sense to them. It's only then that we'll be able to have conversations about some of the hard topics that so often cause division. We're not called to convince people first to have the right understanding of baptism or Calvinism or the end times or COVID. We're called to first call people to Christ himself and then as a body united in that focus on Christ, to seek to grow together in righteousness, holiness, and sanctification. That order is important, and when we lose that, we confuse the message. This should change the way that we engage our communities, our governments, our families, and our world. Yes, be engaged. Engage on all of these important things. But don't lose sight of the gospel, of the good news that brought us together and that is the foundation for our hope and faith as we seek to live out our calling as disciples of Christ. So, as we leave here today, I want to challenge you. Refocus your priorities on the good news that we first heard and that saved us. And if you're not sure if you've accepted that for yourself, come talk to me, talk to Becky Walker, talk to the worship team up here, talk to anybody with BCM or RUF, the College of Christian Studies, there are so many people who would like to talk through this with you. For those of us, though, who have accepted that good news, who are a part of the body of Christ, as we go out, bear witness to Christ. And bear witness to Christ persistently, humbly, and in a way that centers God's work and power rather than our own understanding. That is the message that brings life. That is the message that brings unity. And that is the message that the world needs to hear that is convicting and convincing because it is not our message, because it is the power of God to save. Um, pray with me. Lord, we thank you for the chance to gather here together this morning um, at the end of a week that I'm sure has been long for everyone and full of distractions and tasks and deadlines and lots going on. Lord, we pray that you would help us to take this word, to take the good news of what you have done for us and to go out and to share that, to actually speak of that in our daily lives, in our communities, to those around us. But we pray that you would also help us to remember that this is not about us, that the gospel and the good news are about you. Um, we pray that you would help us to live and speak in ways that reflect you, that center you, and then that allow us to come together at the foot of the cross to worship you. Go with everyone as they walk out into the weekend, um, give them rest, give them restoration, and time together to continue to grow and enjoy this season. In your name, amen. Would you guys stand and worship with us again?
thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your spirit within us, for working in our lives, to draw you closer to you, to make us more like you. Please be with us today as I finish out this week. Um, God, help us not to lose sight of your goodness and your spirit. for how you've blessed us. We give you all the glory. Amen. Y'all have a great weekend. Y'all are dismissed.